Marrying an angel, you say? The wedding night must have been great. Ahem. <clears throat> In the spring of 1894, the young Unitarian occultist, Ida Craddock, had been preparing to give a lecture to a women's group in Philadelphia. The subject of her lecture was her very own love life. She was in a relationship with, intimately involved with, Sof, a disembodied spirit or angel whom she'd met whilst dabbling with a Ouija board. And as they say, it was love at first seance. But before she'd been able to give her lecture, her very own mother, being a staunchly conservative evangelical type, had sought to have her committed to an insane asylum. <laughs> Luckily, however, Ida had caught wind of this fact and had been able, just in time, to escape to New York City. Whilst in New York, Ida had the very good fortune of crossing paths with the British investigative journalist W.T. Steed who himself happened to be interested in all such things occult. So much so, in fact, that he had, in just the previous year, started his very own spiritualism magazine back in London, Borderland. This fortuitous meeting, then, resulted in a job offer for Ida. She was to go to London and become an editor for the magazine. During this period, benefiting from her access to the British Library and the many other books available to her at the Borderland offices, she set about crafting what was originally intended to be her lecture into a book, Heavenly Bridegrooms. And so here it is, the book in question. Uh, the full title is Heavenly Bridegrooms, an unintentional contribution to the erotogenetic interpretation of religion. And there she is on the front cover, Ida Craddock. The book amounts to a justification or rationale for her love life with an angel. It's not, however, just anecdotal, as you might imagine. It's not simply her recounting her own experience. It's actually, for the most part, in an academic style. Um, and all the while throughout, she does recognise that the claim she is making is going to be met with some scepticism, to say the least. So it's polemical. She wants to convince us, her readers. Part of her motivation for writing this is that she had previously, and subsequently, certainly, which I'll get onto, demonstrated a lot of knowledge on the subject of sexual relations. And as an unmarried woman in the late 1800s in Western society, that was a big problem. It suggested she was either a fornicator or, worse yet, insane. So, so she's arguing instead that her knowledge comes from this heavenly bond, this marriage. But despite her unorthodox claim, she does still profess a belief that sex should only be within marriage. Now, despite never being married, there is the question, but did she have sexual relations with men after all? Well, according to her, no, but there is evidence to suggest yes, and I won't get into all that here, but I have put a good biography down in the description. So if, after we're done here, you want to go further down the Ida Craddock rabbit hole, that's where to begin. So, to begin with, in her book, she makes an argument from precedent, beginning with Genesis. A quote from chapter 6, verse 2. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them. In other words, angels bedded women. And the chapter in Genesis even goes on to talk about how a race of men were born of these unions, being heroes and warriors of renown. She talks about how this parallels with the bond between Mother Mary and the heavenly bridegroom, which of course resulted in the birth of Jesus. And she goes into all the necessary provisos there, that in Christianity, when it comes to Mary, it's of course not an angel, um, but God, etc. But for her, it's all part of a larger precedent um, that unfolds out from the Christian tradition, that marital and sexual bonds between people and angels is a natural part of God's order. And she also brings in the church fathers and other theologians to back up this claim. Going on also to explain such pairings are not even unique to the Judeo-Christian tradition, but can be found in other religions too. A lot of religious traditions have heavenly beings impregnating virgin women, for instance. 
In the final few pages, she gives her own experience. She talks about being in the presence of the divine, of God, and the intense emotions which accompanied such encounters, encounters with the God of love, of light. So I'll uh, just quote her directly. I can never tell one minute what will occur the next. As I now sit writing, I am so literally full that every particle of flesh in my body feels as if it were alive and moving. The extreme fullness in the daytime does not occur every day. It'll probably not continue more than eight or ten hours. While I am busy, it is not excessively delightful. But if I were to lean back in my chair or go and lie down, I should soon be completely deluged with floods of heavenly glory and be lost in wonder, love, and praise. The movings of the spirit are unusually undulatory. When I am still, and sometimes when at work, they come like waves of liquid sweetness and roll over me and through me in every conceivable direction and with all conceivable variety. It was said that these moments of rapturous sexual pleasure were so loud that they drew complaints from her neighbours. So, for Ida, this is quite literally how she experienced the truth or the good news of Christianity. And her book almost concludes on a, on a rather conservative Christian note. A conservative if it wasn't for the subject matter. She attests that this sexual pleasure is the result of her giving herself fully to God, um, of repenting of her sins and so forth. In her book, she does not speak specifically of her marriage to the angel Soph. Um, such information is to be found in her extensive spiritual diaries. Um, she kept the content of her book a bit more general, uh, probably in order to not strain the credulity of her readers too far. Um, after four years in England then, uh, she returned to America and established what was effectively a spiritual marriage counselling service in Chicago, um, teaching couples basically how to have better sex. Uh, and she also sent sexual advice through the mail. And it was the mail in particular which increasingly brought her into conflict with the law, as it was illegal at the time to send obscene content through the mail. In 1902, um, she served a few months in prison, um, and then in the latter half of that same year, whilst free, she was convicted once again, um, but this time she was facing five years in prison. And as she was 45 at the time, she regarded that as effectively a life sentence. And so in order to avoid that, she opted to take her own life. As well as having written a great deal on sexuality, she was an advocate of free speech, free inquiry, and championed women's rights. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, this channel is all about exploring the unusual end of the spiritual spectrum. So if that interests you, then please do subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss out. Uh, and if you'd like to watch another, YouTube recommends that one. Cheers.